thanks for being here. We're glad that you've logged online. Um, if you normally join with us at High Street, make sure if you haven't said yet hello, um, do that. Say hello to uh, the people online. It's drop a little like welcome, how you're doing, um, what you think of the band, all that stuff. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, also, if you have not joined with us online in the past, um, we're glad that you're here. Or if, this is, if you're not a normal attender with High Street, we just want you to know you're welcome. We're super glad that you're here. We've been doing uh, the Nourish series. My wife up here, the beautiful lady, beautiful woman who did announcements, um, she uh, helped introduce, reintroduce the Nourish series that we're going through. So each month, like she said, we're doing two cyclical biblical themes um, that kind of like nourish our hearts, our spiritual lives when they're brought together, as well as nourish the lives of those around us. So we looked at Restore, where we know that the God's creation is good, but there's really um, a brokenness that's come into it through sin, and how God, through our faith in Jesus, is doing a lifelong restoration. And as we enter into that restoration, we can experience seasons of frustration where we realize that God, we need God to revive us. And so that was the second topic, God reviving us, breathing life into our places where we need it most, and uh, even flooding our world and our lives with his presence. And so we're actually jumping into the next topic on that this Sunday. It's called presence. So we're going to be doing presence and purpose. This Sunday's presence. The next Sunday will be purpose. Um, and so I'm excited about tying those two themes together and seeing how God will lead us. So I think presence is the natural next step from revive. So, I mean, I'm wondering for you, like, what do you think of when I say God's presence? What comes into your mind and your heart when you think of the presence of God? You know, when I was younger, my dad would wake me up early, started probably when I was around five, and lasted up through high school, and we'd drive to the lake, we'd have all our fishing gear in the back trunk, we would buy some bait at the tackle shop, and I, through my dad, learned to fish. So I learned how to tie these little tiny knots called barrel knots to keep the hook on, I learned how to cast, which is a pretty big feat for a young child. Um, I learned, my dad taught me where fish were hiding, especially when we were out in the boat. He would show me uh, the different places where they like to hide in the reeds or underneath structures. I learned which bait to use and which bait different fish enjoyed. And I learned how to know when there's like a fish on the line, when you get that little tug and your adrenaline jumps, as well as when to set the hook and get it so it, you know, gets it right in its mouth and it's not getting off that line. My dad and I spent hours and hours at the lake. It was only about 15, 20 minutes from our home, and we'd spend all morning there. And the purpose, you know, what do you think the purpose was? Or to catch fish, right? But there was so much more going on in that time together. My biggest catch was, I think I was around fifth or sixth grade. My dad and I and my dad's friend were out on this boat, and we'd been out all morning. We hadn't caught much. Kind of sounds like a biblical story, but it's not. Um, and towards the end, I was trying to fish a little bit, you know, obviously, and my line got tangled around my reel. So the bait was all still in the water, but all the line got tangled there so that I couldn't even reel in. Man, that's so frustrating. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it was towards the end anyway, so my dad said, why don't we just drive in? And so we drove our boat towards the docks, and I just left my line in the water the whole time. Um, once we pulled in and docked the boat, I started to pull at my line, and it stuck on something. And, um, you know, I started to feel like a little bit of a failure as a junior fisherman. I was with my dad's friend, with my dad, obviously, who's an experienced fisherman. And not only was my line tangled, but it was also snagged, which are like two big, uh, you know, embarrassments for a fisherman. So frustrated, I hand it to my dad and say, Dad, like, I think my line's snagged. And so he grabs it gently and tugs on it. And he's like, Dave, that's not a snag, that's a fish. And I could see the line as he starts to pull on it is kind of moving back and forth, like there's something connected to it. So I'm like, you know, we're both getting excited. Our adrenaline is pumping. And um, so I, my dad actually uses his own hand, because the reel's not working, to wrap the line slowly around it as he pulled this fish slowly. And it was, it was really fighting. And it was pulling, wrapping it slowly around his own hand. 
as he gently pulls this fighting fish towards our shore. And as it gets closer and closer, I can hear him saying, it's a big one. So this took a long time. As you can imagine, reels are meant so that you can go quickly and get that fish inside. But hand over hand, it takes a while. But once it got close, we netted that fish, and it was a five-pound trout, still the biggest fish I've ever caught to this day. And um, that, it was just so exciting for me and for my dad and obviously for my dad's friend. Um, but, you know, as I, th- I was thinking about the story, I was like, who did all the work on that fish, right? Like, it, who reeled it in? Who noticed it? It was my dad. But who got all the credit? Me, right? To this day, when I still tell that story now, and with my dad, it's still my fish. Because why? It was on my pole. You know, but now, it's, but now it's our story. My dad's in my story. So my dad has switched to fly fishing recently, and that's actually much harder. Uh, I don't know if any of you have tried that. Uh, but I want to learn, so I've gone on a few trips with, trips with him just to keep spending time with my dad so fun, and just to kind of do what he's doing, be about what my dad's about. So the whole point of that story, if you didn't catch it as I was saying, it was when I'm with my dad, the purpose is important, right? Catching fish. But it's equally, if not more important, that we were doing it together. So we're talking about presence, this being together, enjoying time connection, conversation, memories, adventure. This is the experience that I wanted us to tease out as we think about the presence of God. It's knowing a person like I was knowing my dad relationally, not just facts, not just truth statements, but actual time and investment, being near each other. You see, the presence of God isn't just an idea. It isn't just a feeling. The presence of God is a person. Yes, we know God exists everywhere in his creation. But this presence of God, this person of God, is specifically and specially present with and within those who have given their lives to him through faith in Jesus. The presence of God is is central to the Christian life. You know, at times it's sweet, awesome, refreshing to be in this presence of God. And at other times, it can be frustrating and even confusing. But it is this relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit that can transform us and our world. You know, even Jesus, before he went to the cross, He said this to his his disciples. He said, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Why? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper in this passage he's speaking of is the Holy Spirit the presence of God. You know, what was so important to Jesus about this Holy Spirit that he would say it was better for him to leave so that the Holy Spirit, the presence, the person of God could come to us. A.W. Tozer in the intro to his book, The Pursuit of God, has this great quote. I encourage you to pick up the whole book and read it, but let me read it. I think it's so um, potent for what our culture, our world is going through right now. He says this, and he's speaking, I believe, to the church. In this hour of all but universal darkness, one cheering gleam appears. Within the fold of Christianity, there are to be found increasing numbers of persons whose religious lives are marked by a growing hunger after God himself. They are eager for spiritual realities and will not be put off with words, nor will they be content with correct interpretations of truth. They are a thirst for God, and they will not be satisfied until they have drunk deep at the fountain of living water. 
So today, my goal is that we would paint a picture. For some of you, this will be a reminder. For others, it will be an awakening to what? To the personal presence of God, who is God, the Holy Spirit, with us. Well, before we go further, let's take a moment to pray and turn our attention to this one who's already been here. Lord Jesus, we know you're on the throne. You're sitting on the throne and you reign over this world and you reign over our lives. And because you're on that throne, we have been given access to the presence of God. We know you're everywhere at once, Father. We know that you, there's no part in this universe that you are not present. And that includes our own lives, our own bodies, our own minds. And so as we sit where we are this morning, whether it's on our couch, in our living room, it's in our kitchen, eating breakfast, whether we're on a walk, listening to this through headphones, we recognize that not only are you present, but you are present specifically to those who call on your name through Jesus. And we want to honor that this morning, Lord. We know your Holy Spirit is here, but sometimes we feel as though we've grown unfamiliar with him. He is God, equal God to you, Father, equal God to you, Jesus, but sometimes we forget who it is that we have access to. So we say, come, Holy Spirit, honor the name of Jesus this morning. Would you remind each of us where we are now, in the middle of what we're at, the promise of your presence and the power that that can bring to transform who we are, what we're struggling with, and even empower us to transform the lives of those closest to us. We pray these things to honor the name of Jesus. Amen. So, we can't forget, even like I said while I was praying, that God is always present. Theologians call this the omnipresence of God. It kind of sounds like a cool sci-fi artifact. I have the omnipresence. But it means he's all present, right? He's, he's always here. God's presence fills the universe. He's cosmic. He, there's nowhere that's untouched by him. Psalm 139, Carrie read it earlier, but let me refresh our minds with those words. It says it this way. Where shall I go from your spirit, your presence? Or where shall I flee from you, your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the lowest place, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light be about me as night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Wow. That is like beautiful, and even that ending is such a contradiction in terms. Thinking that light, darkness can be light to God, that there's no place that he is blind to. Um, Hebrews 4.13 says it this way, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All things are naked and laid bare. Let's let that unfold in your mind for a moment. To, the, to his eyes, to God's eyes. When the psalmist hears this, when he writes those words of worship, he ends with this prayer and this cry, Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, that, that realization of God's nearness, of his presence everywhere, both with the things that are closest on our hearts and the things that concern us in our future, God is there. 
And in response to that, the psalmist says, search me, know me. I want to walk in that sort of intimate fellowship with you. And we get these pictures from the Bible of this sweet connection with God's presence. But from the beginning, when we look at Genesis, we realize that that fellowship was uh, perfect at a time, like we talked about in our Restore series, but has been broken through our relationship with God that, through Adam and Eve's sin. God's presence in the garden before they sinned was perfectly accessible. Adam walked with God in the garden. There's this unbroken fellowship and communion with God that Adam shared and Eve. But after Adam and Eve ate that fruit and broke God's command, what does God first say when he, he looks for them? He says, where are you? You know, we all know God knew where Adam and Eve were. He wasn't suddenly blind that they're hiding behind that bush over there or that tree, right? It wasn't, he wasn't concerned about their physical hiding spot. He was concerned about that sudden, infinite distance that now was between them relationally, spiritually. It's like almost saying, God, or Adam, where'd you go relationally with me? Where is your heart now? We used to share that intimate communion. What's come between us? And our whole world, including us, even as Christians, suffer from this broken fellowship still. Yes, even as believers whom God has brought close through relationship with Jesus, we struggle with knowing his presence. A.W. Tozer, who I mentioned earlier, says this, and I love the way he articulates this experience of Christians. I believe that most Christians, this is what he says, do suffer from a sense of divine remoteness. They know God is with them, and they're sure they're God's children. They can take you to their marked New Testament and prove to you seriously and soberly that they're justified and regenerated, that they belong to God, that heaven's going to be their home, and that Christ is their advocate above. They've got the theology. They know all of this in their head, but they're suffering from a sense of remoteness. To know something in your head is one thing, and to feel it in your heart is another. And I think most Christians are trying to be happy without having a sense of the presence. He goes on to say this, the yearning to be near to God and to have God come nearer to us is universal among born-again Christians. And yet we think of God as coming from across the distance to us when the Bible and Christian theology and all the way back to King David declare that God is already here, now. God doesn't dwell in space. And there, God doesn't have to come like a ray of light from some remote place. There is no remote place in God. He contains all remoteness and all distances in his own great heart. What I'm trying to get across is simply this. Nearness to God is not a geographical or an astronomical thing. It is not a spatial thing. It is a spiritual thing. I don't know if that hits home with you, but... So many times when I'm praying, I'm thinking God is millions of miles away. And I've heard a lot of people say, I pray and I feel like my prayers bounce off the ceiling. I mean, let's be real. Being with God, drawing near to him isn't always easy. I mean, the evangelical church, we have some places where we do this normally. On a Sunday morning, we'll worship. We hear me, you know, someone like me give a sermon There's points where we have moments with the Lord, but it's not always easy all the time to draw near to the Lord. We can experience relational and spiritual distance. Some of us have experienced hurt, or at least perceived hurt from God. You know, they thought that life, maybe you thought it this way, I thought that life would be better with you, God. Some of us experience confusion. I know the presence is part of your story, but I I just don't get it. Some of us have experienced being burned by God, or at least um, by his people. 
I've tried so hard to follow you, but, you know, this situation, this person, this happened. I don't know how to reconcile it. We experience shame, embarrassment before God, as if if I was to draw near to you, I would want to cover myself up. Or my sin, I can't bring my sin into God's presence. Talk to him about that. We even have moments where we feel bored by God. I don't know about you, but especially in high school, I sat here in the church and I was like, I'm here, but I'm not really moved by you, God. I'm just, I'm present, but I'm not present. Or maybe I'm present, but I'm not experiencing your presence. And some of us are legitimately hungry for God, right? But even this hunger for God can be hard to maintain in a hard world. So here's my question. So like, if this is our experience of God, at the same time God says he is near and specifically close to those who follow him, like what's affecting our connection with him? What's affecting our fellowship, our relationship with his presence? If God is like this close, if he's like closer than our skin, if he's inside even our secret thoughts, there must be something of this relationship that we can cultivate. I ran across this female blogger this week, and I wanted to read a bit of her thoughts on this. This blog captures, for me, this relational experience of God's presence. This is what the blogger said. Like most kids growing up, I was afraid of the dark. But I wasn't just afraid of the dark. I was afraid of going upstairs by myself into a dark room. Well, doesn't that sound scary? In hindsight, not so much. But from my parents' perspective, this was not something to be feared. They would tell me this often, but that didn't mean the struggle of mine would just disappear. One thing that aided my growing trust and helped me eliminate this fear without me fully realizing it along the way was the routine of my dad praying over me at my bedside. Every night for most of my childhood, until I stayed up later than he would, my dad would be there. The nights when I was still awake in bed, we would chat for a few minutes, laugh together, make up fun phrases that would eventually evolve into a long goodnight mantra. Some nights I would already be asleep, and he would faithfully come and pray over me. Other nights I would hear him coming and would pretend I was sleeping to get a glimpse of what my dad would do when he thought I wasn't looking. He would pray for a long time, too. I remember feeling loved, cherished, delighted in, and not forgotten. I needed these experiences of my dad on bended knee with folded hands and closed eyes lifting me up in prayer. The consistency of this experience, night after night, ingrained in me that my father was with me. And the nights when I was scared, he would lovingly tell me, do not be afraid. You are not alone. And while some have never had this experience with an earthly father, we all get to experience this from our heavenly father. Even though we grow up, one of our roles in relation to God is that of a child. As adults, we begin to judge what fears are reasonable and what fears are not, shutting them down before we're able to name them. But God wants to be with you in your fears, to give you continual experiences of his love and protection. He wants us to consider the lilies, how they sway and grow, bask in the sun, and are taken care of in lavish adornment. So as you hear the words from your father, do not be anxious. Consider his heart for you. He wants to listen. You need his reassurance, and you can begin to experience his tender love in your places of fear. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of God's presence with us. And actually, that author of that blog is my wife, so compliments to her. In a relational experience of my wife's father's prayers, as she had experienced her dad praying over her, she received his care 
his protection and love. And this translated for her to an understanding and experience, a kind of like knowing of God's presence with her. We see in that moment between her and her dad sort of like an image of the sweetness of God's presence. Their good night mantras, even like hiding, wondering what her father would do when, she wasn't, when he thought she wasn't looking. Also, we see in that time transformation happening. This transformation that can also happen as we spend time in God's presence. Of this sweetness, I think that's one of the most attractive things about God's presence. That God and who he is actually affects us in a way that can feel good, can feel sweet. Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist um, of the Great Awakening in the 1700s, had an experience uh, when he was writing in the woods of God's sweet presence. He said it this way, Once, as I rode into the woods for my health in 1737, having alighted from my horse in a retired place, as my manner commonly has been, to walk in divine contemplation and prayer, I had a view that was for me extraordinary. I saw the glory of the Son of God as mediator between God and man in his wonderful, great, full, pure, and sweet grace and love and meek, gentle, gentle condescension. This grace that appears so calm and sweet appeared also great above the heavens. The person of Christ appeared ineffably excellent with an excellency great enough to swallow up all thought and conception which continued as near as I can judge about an hour. This kept me the greater part of the time in a flood of tears and weeping aloud. I felt an ardency of soul to be what I know, what I know not otherwise how to be expressed, emptied and annihilated. I wanted to lie in the dust and to be full of Christ alone, to love him with a whole and pure, pure love, to trust in him, to live upon him, to serve him and follow him, and to be perfectly sanctified and made pure with a divine and heavenly purity. Wow. You can hear Jonathan Edwards' words stretching. He uses really big language that we don't often use in a sermon, I would say. But the, these words where he's almost stretching to express the inexpressible, what it felt like him to have God's personal presence draw near to him. And you could hear for Jonathan Edwards, this was routine. He would go and contemplate walking in the woods and praying. But something about this one was different. Something about this moment with God was so sweet. We talked weeks ago about the idea of revive, God coming to those dust places and breathing life, breathing life in the places in us that have been crushed, that need it most. And we see this experience for Jonathan Edwards where he weeps for an hour because he realizes God is present with him in a special way. And this is a man who led and walked in this so that others saw who God was because of these types of experiences for him. This is the sweetness of the presence of God. So cool. Um, but also with the sweetness comes moments for transformation. So we, we said God isn't just a feeling. Like we, we talk about the sweetness, and it's not just a sweetness of an idea. It's not just a sweetness of uh, an emotion, but it's a sweetness of a person drawing near to us, a relationship where transformation can occur as we engage in it. But how do we reconcile, you know, what we mentioned earlier, that felt distance with God and his personal presence that can transform us? Well, I wanted to take a moment and look at this process in the Bible. We'll take a look at the person of Moses. Moses had great experiences of God's presence. And he also had great frustration and disappointment too. You may be familiar with Moses' story, but let me review it for you briefly. Moses was called by God. I think he's probably in his 60s because he's had 40 years shepherding and he already had grown up in the palace in Egypt. He was called by God when he saw a burning bush while shepherding. He goes up and meets with God and God, God says, this is who I am and calls him to be the deliverer for Israel. He makes Moses' hand go from normal to leprous and then back to normal again. 
and he has Moses throw his staff down, it turns into a snake, and then it turns back into a staff. All this to establish God's power and his presence and his uh, ability to deliver. So Moses timidly accepts this call to be the deliverer of Israel. And he goes on with his brother Aaron to take on the Pharaoh of Egypt. And 10 plagues later, Israel, millions of them, walk through the Red Sea. Did you know that? It was millions. Was maybe, uh, you know, historians estimate two to three million people walking through that Red Sea. These people with Moses receive supernatural bread, quail, and water from God in the wilderness. They face the Amalekites in battle. And if you remember that scene where Aaron and I believe it's Joshua are standing next to Moses, lifting his arms up. And as his arms are lifted, the Israelites win. And when they're dropped down, they're defeated. And so he must, they must raise his arms the whole time in order to beat the Amalekites. Well, they do defeat them, and they arrive at Mount Sinai as a people where they are called to worship the Lord. So you can see Moses had already built, at this point, a significant personal and corporate history with God's presence. So now he heads up to Mount Sinai. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Israel's down there, down you know, below, and uh, they're with Aaron. And as Moses comes down, he sees that Israel has been worshiping this golden calf. And he shatters the commandments that God had given him. Ten commandments are so familiar with in anger. And there's a, I mean, I wish I could recount it for you if you want to go back and read it. There's a lot of drama that happens right there. There's a plague. There's death. There's multiple intercessions before God for all that's gone on in this moment between getting these commands, being in God's presence, and the brokenness of the people. This culminates in God saying, to Israel, through Moses, depart, go from here. You and the people you have brought out of the land of Egypt. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out the people of the promised land. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. It's like you can hear God struggling in relationship with his people and letting them know this through Moses. God says implicitly to them, you know, take the blessing, take the promises, all that I said I would give to you, I will give, but my presence will not go with you. I'll send an angel ahead of you. So when Moses comes to Israelites and says, this is what God said, the people are struck at the heart. They mourn and fast because they know this God, at least experientially. They went through those 10 plagues with him and went through the Red Sea. They received food from his hand, water from his hand. And they're at a crisis and they wonder, will God not lead us anymore with his presence? Will we go on without his presence? So read with me. We're going to look at Exodus 33, 7 through 12. And watch how Moses handles the situation. It's Exodus 33, verses 7 through 12. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, which represented God's presence, would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. So I don't, can you guys imagine that? These maybe hundreds of thousands, millions potentially, watching this cloud descend on this tent that Moses has set aside to be with God's presence. And now they're eagerly wondering, will God's presence continue to go with us? What are we going to do? Moses and God are meeting. Let's continue here in the scriptures. It says, Thus the Lord in this tent used to speak with Moses face to face as a man 
speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, we're seeing a bit of his conversation in the tent here. See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And God said to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said in response, if your presence will not go with me, Do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now, what uh, an intense, dramatic, and beautiful scene. We have this word face-to-face, which the the scriptures here even says implies friendship. He'd speak, God would speak with Moses like a friend. In Hebrew, um, face in this passage is actually the word panayim, P-A-N-A-Y-I-M, which means my person, my presence, me personally, all of who I am. So it's like, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a kid and you say, hey, dad, and the dad looks at you. He's not like talking to somebody else and says, you know, dismisses you, turns to you and says, oh, wait, 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 what do you need? It's like that. It's not, it's not even just that. It's not just attention but it's, it's the whole person of God. Myself is what the word means. My focus, my resources, my protection, my power, my wisdom, me, all of who God is. It's like Carrie's dad praying over her while she pretended to be asleep. And there was like this covering there of Carrie, her experience of God's presence being for her even when she was doing nothing. This is what face-to-face looks like. Numbers 12, 8 uh, reinforces this, saying about Moses, God says this, With Moses, I speak mouth-to-mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Now, mouth-to-mouth, face-to-face, they're very similar. Commentators, I just summarize a little bit of what they say on this. These imply that there's no intermediary between them. There's unhindered intimacy, remarkable communion, and and Moses discourses freely and familiarly with God. You can see just a hint, a pattern of what Adam and Eve experienced in the garden where they walked with the Lord before there was broken fellowship. One commentator said said it this way, God revealed himself to Moses not only with greater clearness and evidence of divine light than any of the other prophets, but also with greater expression of particular kindness and grace. He spoke not as a prince to a subject, but as a man to his friend. The phrase mouth-to-mouth and face-to-face are both synonymous with presence. It's like presence to presence, all of me to all of you. Here we are. The person of God is close to Moses in a tangible, experiential relationship. This is intensely relational. Moses had bet his whole life and his reputation on this living relationship with God. And in this moment, we can see that that intimacy 
between him and the Lord made up for all of the uncertainty that he was facing. Now, I don't know about you, but many people I've talked to are experiencing frustration and uncertainty in the season. This idea of face-to-face ought to begin to tug on our own experience of God's presence during this time. You know, we all have faced times where, God, where we trusted God for something and it didn't turn out like we wanted. You know, even as I'm, even as I'm talking about it, I'm wondering what situation comes to mind for you. You know, recently I've spoken with numerous believers who sense God leading them in the last year or so, year or so to something, to somewhere, and they took a risk. They left another opportunity, another community, and they moved, they made a decision. Only in the midst of that, only months ago, to be hit by COVID-19. They faced loss of jobs. They face now an unstable economy. They face shifts in relationship. And I hear a similar theme coming out of this, God, I thought you were leading this. God, I thought you were in this. You know, I've also known numerous folks who entered into ministry, ministry roles, made sacrifices, bet their lives on God like Moses did, trusting him for peace and provision, only to enter into conflict, division, even betrayal. Things that are not of God, but God allowed them. So though it seems incongruent that God would allow these broken circumstances in the midst of his good plan or calling, the Bible actually shows us that presence is actually, his presence is actually intimately involved. But we only begin to see this and experience it as we draw near to him. You know, Moses' frustration He'd accepted God's call. He said, I can't even speak. Please bring my brother because I'm not good at this. Plus, what's your name? I don't really know you. Who am I going to tell Israel you are? You know, that's when God reveals. He says, I am who I am, Yahweh. And then Moses goes on and faced Pharaoh in numerous plagues. He'd walked through the Red Sea. He dealt with Israel's complaints and false worship. And now what? In the middle of these commandments that are broken on the ground, God's presence wasn't going to go with them? This is the type of conversation that Moses had entered into when he entered into the presence of God. Uh, Another commentary I was reading said that face-to-face is actually an ancient Near East idiom. It can mean heated debate or hard bargaining. It has implicit expressions of frustration and even anger. It's like, uh, you know, Jacob, so you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the generations that God called. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord in one scene. And he, he holds on to the angel of the Lord and says, I will not go until you bless me. There's an urgency and a passion in it, a calling out for God to be who he promised to be. It's like saying, God, this is who I know you to be, and these are my circumstances. Now, God, be who you are. Be you in this. This is the heated debate that we're entering into. This is the hard uh, bargaining that we're entering into. You see this sort of intense emotion inside of Moses' conversation with God's presence face to face. One commentator said it this way, we get this typical Middle Eastern style interplay between God and Moses. Moses questions. God says what he's going to do. Moses disagrees and offers a suggestion. God says no. Moses gets God to see it his way. Eventually, God agrees. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I am familiar with this as, cause, because I'm half Armenian. I grew up in a family. My mom's side is Armenian, and I call this bantering. I grew up watching Armenian women in particular banter over many things, including recipes and how you say certain words and uh, you know, which family member said what or historically what happened in the family. Bantering 
I believe is a love language in the Armenian culture. And I've told my mom this, that her love language is bantering, and she disagrees, which only affirms my point. <laughs> you see, there's actually, in bantering, in this hard bargaining, in this, this real honest conversation with the Lord, there's actually a profound connection that can occur. When you get honest enough to express your emotion to another person, and when you're familiar enough to allow the conversation to bounce back and forth, we're less afraid of being perceived as wrong and less concerned about being right, and we're most concerned about how this relationship will work out. There's actually, in that sort of bantering relationship, there's a surprising safety and connection. It's like, you know, we all watch this. If you have a good friendship, when you first were friends, you kind of navigate each other gently. You know, do you like coffee? Oh, you like coffee? Cool. Maybe we'll get coffee together. You know, but once you're like friends for a while, you're like, I don't like coffee. I actually like tea. Can we stop getting coffee or go to a tea place sometime? And that actually is a sign of deeper relationship when it shifts from pleasing into actually being known and pursuing one another like that. So the, those areas of like relational dissonance that we experience can actually bring us closer to the Lord. They're actually signs and uh, uh, moments where we can experience God's presence in a more mature way. So my question for us and for you is, does your prayer life look anything like Moses's? You know, how comfortable are you talking with God about those areas of your heart? How comfortable are you getting with him face to face? Could you banter in God's presence? And what areas of frustration are you carrying that you may need to talk to the Lord about? What would it be like to wrestle in his presence? Say, God, this is who you are, and this is my situation. Now be yourself here. We look at Moses' response when God promises that his presence will go. He says this, If your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up from here. If your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people? from every people on the face of the earth. What does Moses do in this tense relationship with the Lord? When we look at this prayer, we look at this declaration, he calls on the promises of God. He says, you called us to be a distinct people. How will we be distinct without your presence? He calls on his own personal history with the Lord. I've found favor with you. You know me by name. And at the core, he calls on his desire, his relationship with the Lord of the universe. He says, again, if your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. This is a desperate heart cry from a man who is living in the tension of the broken fellowship with the Lord and the sweetness of his presence that he's experienced. One commentator said, Moses is saying it this way, let us rather live and die in the wilderness with the presence and favor than go into Canaan, than go into the promises, than go into the blessing without it. For even that promise of rest, I value not without thy presence. So Moses echoes back God's words to himself and turns God's promise into a prayer. You know, there's a desperation in the presence at times. You know, it can be good and sweet, but when we're honest, when we've gone through some hard things, when we're dealing with stuff like COVID-19 and uncertain economy, racism, injustice, we need to ache, cry out, wrestle with God. Because somewhere deep inside, we know him. And we know he needs to be with us or everything else will fail. 
And for some of us, it's that point where everything has failed that we can really cry out, God, your presence must come first in my life. Your presence must come first and nothing else. If you remember, Jesus said this while he was on earth. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, obviously, we can do things. We build things and life goes on. But he means relationally. He means spiritually. Nothing of the kingdom, nothing of his presence will be done without him. So I'd like to take a few minutes to pray together about this. We're going to have the band come up, and we're going to think, pray, open up our hearts a little bit to the presence of God who's been here with us as we've been thinking and reading Scripture together. So I want to lead this, um, and I want you to kind of like hold out your hand like a fist, symbolically. And um, I'm going to tell you what's, what you're holding. I'm going to want you to consider what you're holding in your fist. I want you to hold out, um, you know, the area in you that's been highlighted during this sermon, during this time as we've read the word. What have you been considering as we name these frustrations? And put words to it. I want you to name it. Hold out that area. Hold out that disruption that seems to keep you from God. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's loss. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's your own temptations and sin. Maybe it's the problem of evil or unbelief. or Maybe it's COVID. Maybe it's racism. Maybe it's division or disunity. Hold this out before the Lord. And as I lead you in prayer... I'm going to give you some things to ponder and I want you to begin practicing bantering with the Lord. And in that that shared conversation, let him banter back too. And for those of you along the way as we're praying who don't have words for bantering, let the Holy Spirit intercede with you with groanings too deep for words. Take this time to be in the presence, God's presence. Well, Lord, we hold our fists out here because you know our hearts. You're here with us in our homes. You're here even in our headphones as we're walking. You know what we're about. You know the secret, the thing that we hold in our fist the thing that's come up as we've been talking about frustration and how to enter into your presence. And Lord, we just want to have this conversation with you right now in prayer. And so church, as you hold your fist before him, talk to God about what's come up as you considered this place in your heart that needs to experience his presence. Tell him about this area of frustration. Take a moment to do that now. And now tell him who you've experienced him to, him to be in the past or who you know him to be through his word. And lastly, share with him about what you desire for him to do in this situation, in this area of frustration. Now, as you begin to rest in his presence, When you feel comfortable, you can open your fist. I'll open mine right now. You 
can pray with me. God, I know your presence is here, that you've already seen this. But I need your presence in this situation. I need to know that you're here with me. You know my heart now. What do you want to do here? As you're praying, you may have a word come to mind, a song, an image, a verse. Take a moment just to receive that from the Lord. Receive what He's saying and doing. And talk to Him about that. Lord Jesus, we know you've been here this morning in such a special way as we talk about your presence. We can't forget what you did for us on the cross, that it's your death, your resurrection, and your ascension. By that, we've been invited into the heavenly places with the Lord, that we get reconciled to God our Father, and that we get to walk in this life of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you be near each of us? as we've wrestled with some things this morning, as we've remembered your presence and your sweetness and what it means to walk in intimate connection with you. And as we've kind of struggled through some of the stuff that's come up over the past weeks, as we wonder again how to walk close with you, Lord, would you draw near to us now? Draw near in our homes. May our homes, may our families, may our individual walks be a place where your presence is welcome, where you take leadership, and where we have sweet moments, powerful moments, even bantering moments, face to face with you. You've not forgotten us, that you have been near us. Allow us this week to enter into even more personal conversation with you, and would you increase both the sweetness and joy of your presence as we turn to you, as well as your power, your answers to these prayers that we've laid at your feet this morning. You multiply what you're doing and establish your kingdom here in these things and in our lives. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.